Oscar Eponimo. Oscar is a skilled and experienced software engineer and information technologist who is the founder and CEO of Chowberry. Chowberry is an app that connects grocery stores and supermarkets with NGOs and charities to put wasted or leftover food to use. As packaged food items near the end of their shelf life, the app initiates discounts that grow larger the longer the products remain unsold. Recently named Time Magazine's Next Generation Leader 2017, Oscar is also a recipient of Rolex Awards for Enterprise and of the UNITU Young Innovators Award. Oscar Ekponimo will be speaking at the platform. Date, 1st of October, time 9 a.m. Venue, The Covenant Place, Igomu. Admission is free. But to register, visit www.theplatformnigeria.org forward slash register. The platform is powered by Covenant Christian Center. The Let's welcome the CEO of Childberry, Oscar Ekwonimo. Okay, wow. <laughs> um, first of all, I would like to thank um, the Covenant Christian Center, and most especially the highly esteemed senior pastor, uh, Pastor Pojo Yemade, for inviting me here. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey for the past five years, and I'm, I'm so thankful for all of you to have me here, thank you very much. Um, I'm a product of grace, uh, of God's mercies, of God's favor. Two years ago, I was unemployed, struggling with my project, trying to get ahead, and here I am, speaking to you guys and millions of other people, uh, impacted. <laughs> impacted uh, over 50,000 people plus with the work that I'm doing. So I'll be speaking on the power of value, going from idea to reality. Um, while I was preparing for this, it was impressed on my spirit to toss aside the tedious uh, statistics all about food security and all of those things and show the practical reality of how to go from idea to reality. There are many people out there who really want to do something that affects the lives of others, but really don't know how to go about it. And also to speak about how we can be value-oriented and really affect our society and the place that we live in, in a very positive way. So this was what um, I was inspired to do, and um, I hope I look forward to a wonderful time here. The mental structures of every society determines the quality of its physical structures, the boundaries, and the extent of our vision. Everything around us, the way Nigeria is, can be traced back to the collective mindset of everyone in it. Are we thinking in terms of value, in terms of solving problems, or are we thinking in terms of complaining, in terms of identifying only the problems, and not doing much in reality to fix it. And it's very important, the issue about value, because it's central to our existence. We go to jobs because we create value. We earn a living because we create value. The moment we cease producing value is the moment we cease existing. So I'll decide to break my uh, talk into three segments. First of all, I would just share my journey because I find that most times I share my journey, it's very real. People understand and can relate to my personal journey. Okay. And I'll also share the core principles that took me uh, to where I am to achieve some of the things and make the impact that we've been able to, to make at this point. So um, I'll go right into it. I started in 2013. I was in between jobs. And I, I, I mainly thought to myself, what exactly do I do that can be impactful? 
And I use this analogy of being 90 years old, and it's my birthday, and somebody was asked to speak about Oscar Ikunima. What exactly would be written there? What would that person say? And I found out that deep within me, I wanted to make the lives of other people better, simply create whatever it is, something simple that the next person can benefit from. And that was the core of why I founded Childberry. And um, it also connects back to my own personal experience with hunger. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier on in the interview, this is something every Nigerian can relate to. No food in the house, a short time. Um, this was 1997, and there was a short phase where my dad was ill and out of work, and access to quality food was a problem. So looking back at that background, in 2013, I began my journey to founding uh, what we now know and call as Chowberry. Now, as uh, one of my mentors, my main mentor, a great man of God, defines success as impacting your world and your sphere of contact with the investments of your personality. I decided that I would start as small as I can, whatever I have within me that can enable me produce value that everybody else can benefit from. So I began to start small. Um, I designed the initial prototype of what would become an app. Now, prior to this, because of my um, relationship and my experience with childhood, at my childhood, I decided over time, we, uh, myself and my friends, would go out, distribute warm meals to street kids, and they would benefit from that. And this continued over the years. And of course, I went to the university, I studied computer science, and it was just automatic that I would use technology to automate what I was already doing. It was quite a challenge at that time because I could either choose to take a regular job or I could pursue what God had placed in my spirit to do, what I was designed for, and also impact the lives of others while I was doing that. So, um, I created this app and I didn't know where to start. I simply began talking to the retailers and the shops. Prior to that, in the process of distributing warm meals to kids, um, I realized that a particular store where my friend worked were throwing out food. So we walked up to them and said, hey, just before this thing expires on your shelf, why don't you give it to us? And we'll drop it off with the street kids and we can do this over and over again. And then you on one hand, you don't need to throw away things. Us on the other hand are able to provide affordable food or provide food to the street urchins that we were doing. And that was how the whole concept came together of what Childberry is now. So in 2013, we started small. Now it's, it's really very practical. You don't need to have a million dollars, so much more. The little way you can start, that was how I started. Now this is my personal story that I'm sharing. And I would also like to share three key principles that helped me on this extraordinary journey. The first one I call the wellspring principle. Um, it comes from um, the scripture that talks about out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. I realized that all I would ever require is on the inside. All I would ever require. Now, most times people say so-and-so didn't help me. So-and-so, the government didn't do this. No. I came to the consciousness that all I would ever need is on the inside. And once this reality is clear to you, you'd be unshakable. So I looked within and thought to myself, all I'd ever need is on the inside. So I set out on my journey and it has been marvelous. The next principle that I hold dearly is the principle of the loose hanging fruit. Um, not low hanging fruit now, loose hanging fruit, why? At least if it's a tree, if it's high up there, 
it's not low, you can shake it and the fruit will still fall. It doesn't need to be low. So the loose hanging fruit principle talks about what have you readily available, whether skill, whether talent, can you draw, can you take a photograph, can you code, in my case, what do you have already that can be turned into some kind of value? That's the first part of the loose hanging fruit principle. The next item is the resources. What resources do you have? Do you have time? In my case, my resource was the little laptop that I had, where I sat in my room day and night designing the prototype, piecing it together. Do you have some money in your pocket? How can you start? And the third aspect is how acceptable are the people to what you want to do? How is your market accessible? Do the people you want to reach, can you easily meet them, or do you need 100 million to get to them? So that's the next principle that I have. And the third one is the faith principle, the faith principle. The faith principle talks about your inner self. It's so important that you are in touch with your core. I am strong on my faith, and the times where things were very challenging, it was my faith that kept, kept me together. Now, we all hear about how Steve Jobs was big on meditation, and all these people are big on yoga. You have to be in touch with your core. That way, you gather yourself in. So, this was the essence uh, that propelled me, and uh, I like to talk about the analogy of the hardware and the software. Your spirit is the software, and your other physical body is the hardware. Now, if the two are not speaking to each other, it's not going to work. That's how important the inner self is. So, we continued our journey, and we've been able to reach over 20,000 families and household. This is from one of our outreaches with our partner organizations here in Lagos, actually called Itedo Community. And we're able to reach mainly widows, providing them affordable food for their nutrition needs. So um, then we were able to continually provide this relationship with these communities, with our NGOs partnering with them, and we're able to get to them and provide them with affordable food. Uh, I also just want to talk now about this mentality of creating value. I look on Twitter most times, and I find that a lot of people are complaining. There's so much complaint. There are people who talk about how they know the 10 things they need to do with the power sector. Oh, since I was born, it's always been the problem of power. It's always been, oh, no water. We have heard all of this over and over. That's why I don't talk about the problem. I identify the problem with, and then think of the solution. Too many people are complaining without doing much. So it is time for us to change course and begin to think about what solutions in our little way is possible. Um, every opportunity, every problem that we pass up is our opportunity for greatness. The more we ignore the problems around us, talk about it, complain about it, those are opportunities for greatness, for impacting people, for creating change. So this is so important. So that's the first part of my story, about my journey. Um, I will now be talking about the work that I do the work that we do, we've been so blessed, and it's been a marvelous journey. Excited to do the things we do. Um, and our mission statement primarily is providing and enabling um, people to access quality food and healthy nutrition um, using technology. Now, statistics from the FAO in 2013 puts it that 13 million people in Nigeria face hunger. Now, of course, that's 2013. Most likely, with the insurgents here in the Northeast, that figure must have gone so high. And it's very worrying. 
According to the UNOCH, UNOCH, the coordinating organization for humanitarian affairs in the Northeast, it puts the figures at 6.7 million food and nutrition insecurity in the Northeast alone. So we have a major crisis on our hands. Um, somebody has to take care of this. I always think about the analogy, not an analogy now. We are so dependent on foreign aid now, and it's a big issue. Now, a hypothetical case, what if all of these organizations pull out? Think about it. All these international organizations, the DFIDs, the EUs, the USAIDs, what if one day they wake up and say, look, uh, we have our own problems at our home, we, we, we can't take care of this anymore. And the numbers are dropping in terms of funding that is coming through. So we have to wake up. There really has to be impetus and strive. There has to be a turnaround to take responsibility. Now, what is responsibility? That simple ability to respond. Can we respond to the issues of education? Can we respond to the challenges in our health sector by ourselves using sustainable models? That's so important. So, this is our mission and we have been using technology in a very unique way. Now, I'll just run through, through what Childberry really is. Um, Childberry is a simple application that does two things. We are saying, rather than throw away all of these items that would go to expiration in a short time, we are able to connect people that can make use of it in a timely manner, mainly families and households that are facing hunger. And we do this through an application service that we work with the retailers. Now, you would be amazed at how much is lost. The picture you see on your screen is from an actual store. They have tons and tons of this. That's packaged food products, Cyrillac right there. And you would find that what most of them do is either they return it to the manufacturers or they destroy it. It's such a, an alarming scenario. Now, this is just from one store. Now, imagine 10,000 shops or producers of food. So, no one should go hungry when things are going to waste. It's really, it's really, it's really alarming. Now, we are just saying, direct this to those who need it the most. And we don't see our beneficiaries as people who are poor and needy. We see them as an active participant in the food system, helping to stop the waste. Because even people who are vulnerable and poor have dignity. They want to be respected. They want to feel good. So that's what we're doing to ensure that people have what to eat. Um, and over the years, we have impacted over 50,000 families between the Lagos and Abuja area, working with NGOs. We've spread all the way to Nasarawa State. So we've worked in Nasara State, we've worked in Lagos here, and we've worked in Niger State. And it's amazing to see the, the smiles on these faces. There lies our fulfillment that these people have access to quality food. Um, so we, we have, we've gotten a lot of people involved. We have um, volunteers who participate and help us do the work that we do. And we're trying to craft a movement around food to know and help people understand that you shouldn't waste because a lot of people are going unfed. Um, okay, so this is a, a picture from one of our programs. Now, one thing is food access. The other thing is what is the quality of the food, right? You can't just keep on throwing items all around the place, giving people food to eat that are not healthy. So we've transitioned now to healthy food. Now the bag you see there is specifically crafted with our nutritionist to ensure that every meal inside there, every item inside there covers the six classes of food, um, and then it lasts that person for at least five days. <laughs> and
And we don't just go in there. If you notice, we have women mostly, right? Working with our NGOs, we have a targeting mechanism that ensures that it's mainly female head of households, families that are orphaned. At one point, we met one lady who was a widow, and you'd be amazed. She earns 400 naira a week. She survives on 400. Now, it's even just probable. The community is Gishiri. It's, an, it's, on the, it's right in front and in the middle of Meitama in Abuja, for those of you who know Meitama in Abuja. Now, 400 naira is even just probability because she sells kunu, and you're not allowed to hawk in Abuja, right? So most times, she hawks it, and the task force people seizes her item, and she comes back home with nothing. Now, recently, we worked in a place called Piakasa, and one of the women there told us sometimes she had to choose between uh, paying for school fees or providing food for her family. So this is the reality on the ground. And nobody is going to solve this problem for us. I don't want to reel out the problem why there is hunger. Land use act is an issue. Post harvest loss is an issue. But we, we have to solve this. It's so important. And I'm really inspired by the work uh, Yvonne is doing. That's a real problem. And she's actively engaging and fixing it. So that's about what we do in the work that we do. Um, the third part of what I want to talk about is the future. Um, we're scaling what we're doing to reach more people. Um, what we're doing now is moving towards nutrition even more. Because even the farmers, nutrition is a problem. Many children out there have learning disabilities because of the quality of the nutrition. Now, according to statistics from the World Food Program, um, when a mother is undernourished during pregnancy, the baby also is undernourished. And every year, 17 million children are born this way due to the mother's nutrition before or during pregnancy in the developing world. So even the mother is undernourished, and then when she gives birth, the child is also undernourished. That is why you find in some parts of the country, they can't even assimilate school. So even though when you put them in the school, provide the education for them, it's still a problem. So we are working now with um, an organization to bring nutrition and food fortification to over 10 million people within the next five years. You see, the way the food system is structured is very unequal. Right now, the farmer farms his maize, farms his maize, uh, his wheat, and all of these staples. And then the big companies come, buy it from them, fortified with nutrients. I'm sure we've seen some of those packaged food products, nutrient fortified, vitamin A, B, D, and sell it back to us at cutthroat prices. Now, those guys can't afford it, right? So, but you took it from them, but they can't use it. And all they rely on is the staples, starch, carbohydrates, no nutrients, no vitamin A, no vitamin D. So what this project is called, the Convergence Project, and it came out of MIT and Harvard Business School to bring breakthrough technology to 10 million Africans beginning in Sierra Leone, and Kenya, and hopefully Nigeria at some point. Um, so that mainly is the future of what we're doing, so that farmers in local communities not only are able to get access to this quality um, added fortified nutrition, uh, food fortification, they are also able to do it themselves, so that somebody else doesn't need to sell it to them. They have the tools, they have the mechanism to deploy it and fortify their food, and are able to feed their children with high quality nutrition. So the next thing that um, I was inspired to do, I realized there are a lot more people that can benefit
from innovation, there are a lot more people that want to innovate. So I want more childbearers to come up. I want more innovative solutions to our local problems. I always think about, for example, a solar-powered ultrasound machine, which is one of the things we are looking to build with the next project that I'll show you. Um, many rural communities do not have access to point-of-care diagnostics. So imagine in your village, for example, nobody has ultrasound there. There's no power. Nobody looks, knows. They can't diagnose kidney diseases and all of that. Here's the point. The Chinese are not going to build it for us. Other, P other countries are not going to come down and solve these problems for us. But what is the gap? We don't have the technology capacity, we don't have the skills, we don't have the know-how down here. So how can we create such solutions? And not only to create the solutions that we can use here, but also export it, because the challenges are the same in other developing countries, like India, Pakistan, Nepal, Laos, or South America. So how can we bring knowledge down here, transfer the technology to create things like that? Which is why we decided to found Gallery of Code. It's a blend between arts, science, technology to innovate new solutions for the African continent. And we're partnering with a wonderful organization out in Austria called Ars Electronica. And they are at the forefront of science, technology, arts. And it's been an amazing thing. We moved around looking for support. And um, we were grateful to the good people of Austria and the local um, embassy here also is supporting us on this. It is funded by the government of Austria, actually. So we would have scientists and technologists run exchanges um, and run possible R&D with local scientists here in Nigeria, local engineers here, like the people you see there. These are people from the street. We put out an application online, and hundreds and hundreds of young Nigerians, talented. You'll be amazed at the talent we have in this country. Yeah. We'll be amazed. But these talents have to be refined, have to be shown how to package these things, and how to scale them, which is why we're excited. And just in August, we had the first visiting scientist, who is a Professor Horst Hartner, come in and work with some of our locals here, our local uh, engineers. It's a mix of engineers, embedded system designers, and they are creating solutions. One of the solutions a wonderful gentleman there is creating is to detect um, diseases in poultry for the agricultural sector. Now, when a particular In big poultry, when a bird has a disease, right, it spreads quickly. If, if it's a farm with a thousand birds, how do you isolate one in a timely manner? And he's using ultrasonic sensors to decide and define those boundaries so that one is isolated. Now imagine what this portends. We can export this technology to other African countries, India or wherever. We have to build these solutions and help our people. And that's why I'm passionate about the things that I'm doing. Um, I just also wanted to take the time and, and speak to us about value, about creating solutions. We cannot continue complaining. It's enough. Yes. It's enough. It's enough. It's enough. So, in the most little way, whatever it is, whatever sector, we have to be inspired enough to create those solutions that can lift people out of poverty, that can influence and change the status quo. So, I would just leave us with a, a short video about this project, if it's available. Otherwise, that would be my closing remarks. Thank you so much. Okay, the festival is clearly targeting the elite of art and science as well as the as the uh, free arts nature. And that this year is actually on the way at the very moment. So it's 
Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.